Hello, welcome to Shaman Sister Sessions, episode 58, Science and Spirituality. I am Catherine Bird, and I am so honored to be here with my shaman sister, Michelle Hawk. And we bring you this podcast every week with discussions that we were having uh, personally as dear friends and collaborators on our spiritual paths as facilitators, healers, mentors, and guides for uh, this work and the uh, evolution of consciousness on the planet and wanted to bring you in so that we can continue this larger scale discussion around what it means to be a healer, what it means to be a part of the evolution of consciousness. And this is an exciting episode to be diving into today. Uh, coming with my dear friend Michelle, who has uh, an extensive science background and an extensive spiritual background, and uh, so much to share. I know she's so excited about this topic, is just like jumping up and down around it. And so I'm really excited to be here with you, Michelle. Mm -hmm, me too. And yeah, Kat's right. I was so excited last week. I announced our. Podcast was about science. So when I was doing our little intro, I was like, science and spirituality. It was like, no, wait, that's next week. I have a great deal of experience in from different angles. So this is a, uh, you know, in particular with the alchemy work that I've been stepping into really strongly, uh, this is something that is super lighting me up and definitely a personal passion of mine of like, how do we bridge that gap between the perceived separation or the perceived distance between these two fields that are really so deeply intertwined as both. So let's, yeah, let's just jump in to talk about that. When I say this perceived gap, again, really, we're talking about very much the same thing. These are two sides of ultimately the same coin. And if we're looking at um, you know, ultimately the core investigation of science and the core investigation of really this great multitude of spiritual practices. We're speaking in great generality here about these different spiritual traditions, but ultimately it's truth. You know, it's this investigation of truth and what is and what is life and what is our, our, our role in this bigger spectrum. And, you know, we have these kind of different ways of looking at it. And just as there are many different scientific methods, many different scientific practices and means of investigation, there are so, so many spiritual practices and means of investigation as well. So we're kind of doing great generalization here for this episode in terms of science and spirituality. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And uh, oh, yeah, because there's so much, there's so much to say here. There's so much uh, depth to this topic, um, and you know, to who we are as as uh, spiritual practitioners, and um, and its you know correlation to to science. And I think that we can all admit that the the more that we understand about the nature of the universe, the more that we understand about science, the more that we can see that it is uh, corroborating a lot of what we have learned through spirituality, what has been learned through shamanic practice, uh, the wisdoms that ancient people were were following, um, that they were incredible scientists and in, in some ways, is seemingly greater scientists than we are now. And, you know, how do we bridge that gap? Because there has been such a chasm in a lot of people's minds and the concepts that somehow spirituality and science are not uh, able to, to meet each other, that if you're a scientist, then you uh, do not believe certain things or have a spiritual nature and that if you are someone who is a spiritual practitioner that you have somehow lessened your um you know your 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 clout or your uh you know your your 
cred. <laughs> yeah, your credit, your spirit cred in in scientific realms. And we are we are seeing people who are really pushing against uh, both of those uh, both of those misconceptions. And you know, how do we as spiritual practitioners, uh, uh, you know, how do we bridge that gap? for ourselves and for, for others, for people we're working with, maybe people that are coming from more of a scientific background and are, are wanting more scientific or, or real life. I, I need a real explanation for these things and why these things are true. Um, you know, how do we, how do we stand, stand for, for this uh, bridging of, of who we are as humans? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's zoom back a few thousand years or several thousand years and look at uh, the historical context that we're referring to when we're looking at what are the origins of science and the origins of spirituality. And ultimately, they share the same origin. If you look at the very early spiritual traditions, you know, alchemy, for example, that's something that I've been spending a lot of time on lately investigating and having a context for the purpose that people had for, uh, you know, for doing what we would now label science was actually a very deeply spiritual purpose. People were looking to uncover the nature of reality and pe people were looking to explain the world that we live in, explain our bodies, explain, uh, you know, the m animals, explain plants, explain the different elements around us. And, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, that was a very divinely inspired investigation. If we're looking at, you know, to use some of these familiar terms and that have a little bit of religious connotation, if we're looking at, you know, God created all things, so to speak, well, let's understand that. Let's understand the, the spirit in the world around us. Let us view the sacredness of life and seek to understand the sacredness of life. And thousands and thousands of years ago, there wasn't really even a concept of science. There was a concept of truth and matter and how do we uh, you know, uncover the spirit in the matter and in the different humors, you know, looking at these, uh, you know, the kind of the investigations and the beginnings of medicine, modern medicine was looking at the, the way that spirit existed in the body. So, you know, it's really the concept of science, quite honestly, is really a very modern invention. And for a very, very long time, everything that we now label science ultimately fell under the umbrella of spirituality and religious practice. Yeah. And, and I think we could dare to say that science is uh, um, spirituality and practice. <laughs> you know, on the physical form in manifest, you know, in the manifest reality. And we can see this, as you said, in, in all over the world, in every tradition, um, we're looking at the ancient Egyptians and their advanced uh, science and abilities to, uh, you know, work with materials and uh, that, that it was so focused on uh, spirituality, on um, evolving consciousness on, uh, you know, getting to a place where you truly did understand and were more conscious of everything and that the processes that they were going through were steeped in, 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 in sciences, in utilizing specific techniques that were breathing techniques, practices done through the physiology, um, utilizing specific uh, scents and sounds and tones, frequencies, all of these things that have a relationship to science, but that were being used in very specific divine ways in order to achieve a spiritual result for the practitioners. And we can also see that I've been studying a lot around uh, Taoist uh, ancient traditions and alchemy and um, the shamans from uh, China and from the East. And same thing is that they were receiving so much scientific information on how the body worked on uh, the way that the physiology formed inside of the, the, the body and in, in the womb and the way that the organs formed and the way that 
um, you know, everything about the body, right? They, they were, they were masters and geniuses to create acupuncture, to create these massage techniques, to create all of these different techniques, which are still alive today, which have scientific merit and reason behind them. And that they were, they were deeply connected to spirituality. They were deeply connected to the, the workings of the universe, to the relationship to man, to the elements, and to the spirit, to the all that there is, and how that creates um, you know, a way that we can work through the physical form in order to achieve a heightened state of consciousness and evolution and growth. Yeah, you know, so we're throwing a lot out here. And so let's look at, you know, in, in particular, like the, the Taoist philosophy that Kat was referencing around the body, around moving energy through the body, acupuncture, health systems. We also, uh, you know, can thank this ancient spirit or these ancient spiritual practices for astronomy, for mathematics, for chemistry, for physics, or ultimately all of these investigations were, and all of these branches of what uh, you know, what constitutes kind of our modern conception of science came from let's try to explain the divine and let's try to explain our world from a divine perspective and, and seeing spirit in all of these forms. So where did that split even occur? You know, if we're looking at science and spirituality ultimately as really looking at the same thing. You know, Kat, I love how you said that science is spirituality in its practice, right? You know, where did that division occur? And I think a lot of this, again, relatively recently, like speaking, you know, in the last few hundred years or, or several hundred years, perhaps, rather than, you know, on the order of thousands of years, um, in, in a lot of I think different ways and yet one of the biggest ways that we can explain this split especially in the Western world is around uh, religious doctrine mm -hmm. and around the way that you know think of these scientists who we now know were you know we're doing the right thing and we're having legitimate ex uh, investigations like Galileo for example and um, you know these other well-known scientists who were defying the limiting religious doctrine and what the position is so where is trying to prove exists in all things all that the earth is not the center of the universe the sun is this, or of the solar system, excuse me, the sun is the center of the solar system and implying that, uh, you know, giving a different center of power and ultimately it, it always, as always, comes down to power. And, uh, and Kat, you could probably answer this better. Please uh, tell us a little bit about kind of the, the history of Qigong and, you know, I know in relatively recent history, the way that Chinese medicine just relatively recently. Yeah, I, you know, the, it was written about, um, you know, in what, 2000, whatever, uh, BC, right? Like thousands and thousands of years ago, they were writing about Qigong practices, um, meditation practices, breath practices, movement practices, and utilizing these um, along with, you know, acupuncture and, and, and these other, you know, working with herbs and, and these other pieces in uh, ways to expand consciousness and to understand the physical body, the spiritual body, and the energy body to, for health and well-being and evolution and growth. And, you know, just as in a lot of our Western uh, world where there is this, this great fear that if you truly understand yourself, if you truly understand your spiritual nature, if you truly understand energy, then you will no longer be 
uh, need the um, the government, the you know, and you will no longer need whatever the the church sort of system is. And you know, uh, even as recently as the '90s in China, there was a huge pushback against uh, medical qigong being utilized, um, so that it actually is taken a lot of these practices and the teachings out of um, out of the hands of the instructors and and um, you know we, we see this all over the place where at different times there have been um, pushes where it's basically illegal to teach and that's why these secret societies have uh, have occurred all over the planet to keep these uh, teachings alive because at certain times if you held these teachings if you taught them if you engaged in these practices you would be killed and so right now is this amazing time where we have access to teachings that at any other time for for so long have been undercover you had to be initiated you had to risk your life risk your family's lives in order to learn these techniques and practices and and you know ancient teachings and now here we are with them. Um, and you know the thing is that we are always at risk of losing these um, these teachings and these practices if we're not uh, holding them and holding the lineages and holding um, them people have sacrificed everything to to allow us to have access to this information which I think is just such a, an, amazing, an amazing testament to uh, humanity's awareness of the importance of these practices and teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're speaking to something very, very important here. And uh, I, am, I by no means claim to be an expert in uh, you know, East Asian history. And yet, you know, I know what you're referring to with the, the suppression of uh, you know, medical Qigong, for example, as part of the medical practice. And, and I know that that it was really used as a prescription mm -hmm. in medical practice of, you know, feel into your energy body, learn your energy body, learn, you know, how your chi is flowing, supplement your chi before we treat you with herbs, before we treat you with acupuncture, etc. And or perhaps in collaboration with, but ultimately teaching prevention, teaching awareness, teaching empowerment. That's the first thing that had to go. Right. In well, yeah. and, and they had, you know, at one point where the reason why they had so many people when you see um, maybe you know, the concept of people in parks doing Qigong, like big groups of people doing Qigong together was because it was part of a prescription. When you went to the doctor, then you had to go and you had to have a sign off that you did 30 sessions of Qigong before you got to go back to the doctor again, because they wanted to make sure that you were taking care of yourself and they didn't have enough doctors to go around for everybody. So they had to like, okay, well, what else can we do? But we see today the uh, the power when we talk about uh, the power the power of be you know in the past has been the church um, and governments and now we have pharmaceutical companies you know are the power insurance companies are the power in America at least and so the idea of well we're not going to pay for something like acupuncture nutrition uh, preventative therapies. Um, we're not going to pay for those things. Just wait till you get sick and then we'll give you pills and we'll, you know, put you on prescription programs. Um, you know, this is, this is another way that people are not being um, uh, given the opportunity to learn about their energy body, you know, the way that, that, that things work in their, in their systems and their fields to be empowered towards their own energetic and spiritual development to avoid illness and disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we're looking at, you know, what is honestly kind of, what is the, the core function of a spiritual practice? Let's talk about that. Uh, and just for a minute, because if at least the way that I, I run my spiritual practice for myself and the way that I, really highly encourage anyone who comes to see me is your spiritual practice is a benefit to your human life. And I tell people, you know, I say this all the time, any spiritual practice that you cannot apply 
to your lived experience is not worth your time. So, you know, there's got to be you know, a tangible benefit, whether it supports your physical health, supports your emotional well being. Obviously, those work in combination, you know, but ultimately, spiritual practice in serves our empowerment, our wellness, our health, our relationships, our financial stability, and supports us in being who we are as fully expressed healthy, whole beings. That's for me, the function of a spiritual practice must under, you know, un double underline serve all of those components. Now, if we're looking at ultimately, you know, science theoretically is also serving. How do we support people in their health? How do we understand the body more? How do we use technology to create wellness, to create systems of support? And, and yes, at just as much in science as in the spiritual practice, there are people who are not working in alignment with that. There are people who are creating systems that take advantage of people that, you know, there are plenty of cults out there taking people's money on the spiritual front. And there are plenty of pe people using science to poison people, to create, um, you know, addictions and, and systems of dependency. So you know, none of these, nobody is exempt, no group is exempt from people using the system to take advantage of people. And yet, ultimately, if we're looking for kind of what is that core ideal, ultimately, the core ideal, like, why do people come become doctors, like, for the most part, because they want to help people, you know, there, there's people want good people want to use technology, there are people out there, like, um, you know, the Tesla company, for example, um, what's his name, Elon Musk, right? You know, he's using all this development, this really brilliant innovation to create systems that are affordable, that are supportive of green technology, that are renewable, sustainable. So he's using science in a way to empower and to support and create lives, enhance people's lives and well-being. Mm -hmm. And I think that that leads into an important point around um, you know, science, like science without consciousness, science without uh, any connection to spirituality is dangerous. At this point, um, we have developed uh, science and technology to a level where we are putting ourselves at risk uh, with artificial intelligence and uh, rampant uh, science that's just, oh, let's, let's change all the food and genetically modify and let's clone and let's, let's make animals in labs. Let's, uh, you know, just... Let, you know, do all kinds of experiments on people and animals and plants and, and the world and uh, create uh, weapons. Uh, sorry, the internet's not amazing today. Um, creating weapons, creating uh, chemicals, uh, all, you know, the connection to spirituality gives us ethics. It gives us, uh, oh, that's maybe not the right thing to do. Yes, I could do that. That's possible. But is that the right thing to do? Is that for the highest and best of everyone involved for all humanity? Or am I coming from a place of just, you know, wanting to ego or money or, or one of these other pieces? When, when those that are engaged in scientific development have a spiritual anchor and core, then they're more likely to act out uh, in ethics. They're more likely to stand up for something that's right. They're more likely to, um, you know, kind of do the right thing for humanity instead of for themselves or for the company they're working for or uh, for just rampant, uh, unchecked uh, technological growth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that you're bringing in the, the ethics component. And that's where... You know, I've, I've heard a lot of people ask this question and like, what is our responsibility as scientists? You know, can we do this? Does that mean we should? And that's where, you know, especially with, as we're getting into some of these kind of scary, quite honestly, kind of scary developments about um, really very drastically altering the nature of life and the nature of reality. Like, yeah, just because we can, doesn't mean that we should do that. And um you know, I love, again, asking that question, like, is this for the highest and greatest good? That's where that 
uh, you know, labeled as, as the ethics department of scientific investigation. And, uh, and, you know, with a lot of the wounding, let's speak to the wounding here, because I know I, I'm one of these people who, I have a science background, and for me, the two were never contradictory. So my scientific investigations, to me, never seemed in opposition to my spiritual practice, and vice versa. My spiritual practice, to me, did not seem unscientific. It did not seem um, out of, uh, you know, I, like I was taking anything very much out of context. And I think a lot of people have some really significant wounding. I will say, especially on the science side, there are so many deeply wounded scientists out there who have a, like a giant chip on their shoulder. Let's be honest, a giant chip on their shoulder when it comes to spirit, when it comes to religion, when it comes to any type of practice that is spiritual in nature. And honestly, I mean, how much of that has to do with you know, somebody's lived experience and how much of that has to do with karmic wounding or with past life wounding, you know? And so I think probably, and in, in my personal opinion, probably the latter, because how many, you know, how many eight year olds out there do you know who have personally experienced religious persecution or personally experienced um, being burned at the stake or whatever, and yet have this giant chip on their shoulder of that's unscientific, which means you know, like, and I say this as a, a, you know, former young person who experienced <laughs> ridiculous amounts of being made fun of and being like accused of being against science from kids, from fucking kids who like, I can guarantee you the people who were accusing me of being against science had never experienced this, this persecution firsthand. And yet carrying this wounding very much like close to the heart. And I think that to me speaks volumes to the collective wounding that we as humans have experienced in this really harsh severance of it is not okay to bring spirit into the realm of science because it is profoundly dangerous to do so. And the only reason that that energy would be so prevalent in the scientific community of like danger, you know, scorning response. Like, why would we be so resistant to something if, if it had not harmed us greatly in the past? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why would we be taking it so passionately, personally, intensely? Yeah. Um, and I think that's important because we don't think of that often. And oh, I mean, I, I think that goes with, with any a group that we're maybe having a disagreement with or we can't understand their perspective or we're like, why can't you just get your shit together and stop being, you know, persecuting other people? Um, you know, is, is that, that awareness of, of karma and past lives and, and what people have experienced in other times and places uh, that causes so much fear and, and um, doubt and, and, you know, just a, a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it's interesting because we, there was such a shift, right? There was such a shift because the original scientist was the shaman, right? It was the medicine man. It was the, you know, basically the witch, right? The, these were our scientists. These were the midwives. They were our scientists. They were the ones who had the greatest understanding of physiology, of plants, of uh, nature, of elements, of uh, the ability to, you know, go into trance states or medicine states and receive information from nature, from animals, from plants, and receive that and, and come up with, um, you know, receive uh, prescriptions for medicines for people out of the huge pharmacopoeia of plant, plant life and receive uh, processes for uh, healing things using movements and breathing and uh, you know how did they figure this stuff out well they were in deep connection with nature and with spirit and when those pieces kind of pulled apart from each other and then it became about um, the now this is science over here and you spiritual people actually um, that's not that's not how you gain information that's not how the world works um, then this huge chasm opened up between these two people, which allows for persecution and then it allows for a misunderstanding and it allows for 
uh, you know, one group of people to believe like I'm right and you're wrong instead of, mm -hmm. you know, where we're at now, which is this deep need for collaboration, uh, to, to bring these people together to understand each other so that so that we can have a positive effect on the environment and a positive effect on health, a positive effect on people's well-being. Mm -hmm. There's almost a, a reaction, and, and I'm putting words to this, but I think you'll understand the sentiment behind it, but there's almost this feeling of how dare you use science to justify your spirituality? Like, how dare you? And, uh, or you're twisting the interpretations or you're using science somehow to justify what you want to believe. And I see that I've seen that actually quite a bit and it blows my mind quite honestly, as a scientist, both as a scientist and as a spiritual practitioner. And, uh, and I'll share from the, the scientist perspective, science ultimately is about asking questions about the nature of reality posing hypotheses of like, maybe this is a way that this might work, and then setting up an experiment to see yes or no, if that's how it works. And at the true nature of science is you're not supposed to be attached to the outcome. You're not proving one way or the other. You're not like, okay, if my results all say, you know, if my hypothesis is yes, this is the case, or no, this is not the case, and my my results are all saying, no, this is not the case. And yet I have one single piece of data suggesting that yes, my, this might be the case. You're not going to be pointing at all at that one piece of data. You're going to say, okay, overall this says no. And so there's supposed to be this, like, let's have these resources be our allies in supporting us in the investigation of truth. And yet people get so deeply personally wrapped up in it that you know, even if all the data is pointing at like, maybe this spiritual practice is for real, like maybe, maybe yoga helps the body, maybe sound healing has a positive physiological effect. People are still going to get really invested in, I have a personal, you know, we love our personal beliefs, right? Like I personally believe that this is total bullshit. And so you know, even if all the data is suggesting this thing, I'm, I'm not into it. And that's where you know, I've, that's why I say from the scientist perspective, it blows my mind because it has its own dogma. You know, people associate dogma with the religious context and there is absolutely religious and spiritual dogma. And yet science has its own dogma too, that is just as emotional, emotionally charged. It's way more socially acceptable. I will say that it is super much more emotionally acceptable to be a, a, a dogmatic scientist fanatic than it is to be a religious fanatic. And, um, and yet it can be just as damaging. So this is where, you know, as we're talking about how can we integrate these, we're going to be talking about what is the intersection of science and spirituality in the modern context, being aware that the investment and the attachment that we have to science can be just as strong as some of these religious crackpots that we see, quote unquote, pardon me. <laughs> the, the dogma is just as strong. It's just like, which team are you playing for on the dogma front? And, and when people can't see that, I just have to look at and go a little bit of like, oh my God, you are your own worst nightmare. You're just using different language. So we, none of us are exempt from that. None of us are exempt from getting passionate and fired up and having blind spots. Mm -hmm. All of us do. And it is just as prevalent in the scientific community as it is in the spiritual community. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I see is that, um, you know, there's there's often such like you're saying people are invested they're invested in something being the way it is and um you know there's so much like i am right this is how it is and my backup is this you know whatever that backup is and like we can see this in um let's say the evolution <laughs> argument for some reason that there's an argument about this um that you know there are there are museums that are devoted to the fact that 
the world is only a couple of thousand years old and that the dinosaurs were hanging out with humans and like things that are not scientifically uh, like there's no basis in actual science for things to be believed in a certain way, but because you know the Bible and this is how things are, there are people who are so invested in this that like there is no talking to a lot of people when once a belief system is so deeply entrenched in their being and you know, it can cause so much anger within us, you know, if we come in contact with somebody who is, you know, spouting off these beliefs around something that's, you know, seems so foreign to us on either side. So if somebody, you know, very Christian sort of in fundamentalist, you start talking about yoga to that person, you're like of the devil, like you are, you know, really bad and you're against Jesus, you're against God. And so there's this huge, you know, there's this huge chasm between people and, you know, so much anger, so much like, I am right, you are wrong. And um, there, like, there's no ability to have a, a, a real conversation are around uh, possibilities of things being maybe different than we think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's look at some of the ways that that is shifting because it is shifting. There are, you know, so you mentioned yoga. Also, mindfulness is popping up now all over, especially, you know, we're looking at this through the, the lens of the U.S. here, but all these articles in, uh, you know, in, in major publications and looking at what is the effect of mindfulness on our physical health and well-being, how are corporate environments offering mindfulness trainings and practices to their employees because they see that it has benefit. You know, I was watching something, um, oh gosh, I don't remember, something on... Hmm. I don't remember what channel, but it was a CEO of a, a good sized company who had a, a spiritual awakening of some kind, and he wanted to implement mindfulness for his company. So, he, but he was getting some resistance from his employees. So he implemented a, a random study of the employees who, you know, some of them were kind of assigned to do mindfulness practice and some of them were not. And taking data over the course of about six weeks, I believe, you know, looking at blood pressure, looking at quality of sleep, looking at productivity, looking at, um, you know, overall emotional health and well-being and quality of life, the employees who were implementing mindfulness had increased productivity, better quality of sleep, you know, all the things that you would imagine. And over the course of a year, I think the company saved some pretty good size amount on healthcare payouts because the, or um, the money that they were providing for, uh, for their employees' healthcare. And people were taking fewer sick days because they were healthier and they were happier at their work, better job satisfaction. So there are more and more people are getting on board with, actually, this might be, you know, have me measurable physiological effects. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So yoga and mindfulness, um, I think, are kind of trending right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh and thank goodness. And we can see this in, you know, there are starting to be programs in schools and some places using meditation and mindfulness, and they're seeing huge results. Um, pro programs in prisons with yoga and meditation that they are seeing phenomenal results. Um, you know, and then also utilizing science, utilizing brain scans and, you know, like you're saying, measuring people's blood pressure and heart rate to be able to scientifically view the effects of meditation on, uh, for people so that we can see, oh no, it's not just a thing that we're making up. It's actually scientifically prove, proven that these things change your brain, they change your blood chemistry, they change your organ function. And, you know, we can see through, you know, like, you know, acupuncture and in different kinds of other modalities, uh, shamanic practices, that, that we can see a change in people.
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Some of the other areas that are undergoing a lot of investigation around this are sound healing also, measuring the vibration of, for example, with the, um, the singing bowls, the tuning forks. I know um, I've trained in some tuning fork sound healing modalities, and so I've been exposed to what are some of the studies that they're doing. They're able to actually measure that certain frequencies repair DNA. Like they can actually go in and look at, okay, here's what the DNA is like before being exposed to this, measure what chemicals in the body are adjusted upon receiving certain sonic frequencies and look at, um, you know, again, levels of different chemical composition, stress hormones, cortisol, the structure of DNA in response to sound. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's super amazing. And, um, you know, I, I think that like the further along we go, the more that we will realize, um, you know, and, and it's quite possible, you know, when we look at America, especially like there's, it, it just seems like such a clusterfuck over here um, in a lot of ways, like just looking at our systems and the way things are. And in a certain way, it's almost like, you know, maybe the, the, you know, the, the chaos, right? The storm before the beautiful quiet that comes in of, you know, what does it take for people to maybe have to get to a certain place, to have to get to a certain level of uh, illness and disease in order to start changing their awareness and their, their concepts of what is truly life, you know, nurturing and supportive mm -hmm. And to start thinking outside the box, I, I see this a lot in, in medicine work and working with plant medicines and infinogens and uh, people who are experiencing a lot of physical or emotional uh, mental anguish and pain. And then, you know, starting on a, uh, a, a, a plant medicine path, which then opens up greater realms of spirituality and then and then they start considering other things oh well meditation maybe is a thing and oh these sounds if they that feels so so in you know that feels so nurturing to me and vibrations oh maybe the maybe what i'm listening to maybe really does have an effect on me so i'm going to start changing my daily patterns of what i'm exposing myself to and slowly finding their ways out of patterns of addiction and uh, you know, ways of being that aren't serving their lives. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, the, you know, plant medicines, entheogens, these ceremonial uh, medicines are very much coming to the entire world in a big way. And we're seeing a lot of people engage in these, um, in these ancient practices and these shamanic techniques that are giving them access to a deeper understanding of, oh, maybe I could open my mind a little bit more and welcome in other possibilities. Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason it's making such a big resurgence is because people feel that they've only had part of the picture for quite a while. And, and I think, you know, speaking to that personal intersection there, you know, as, as I've shared before on this, podcast, my background is in biology. I have my degree in animal physiology and behavior and looking at, you know, I took cell bio classes. I had to take chemistry. I had to take, you know, I was taking geology. I was looking at then calculus and all these other classes in the science department. And I remember even in high school thinking about, wow, or actually, no, it was even before high school. It was in, I think around seventh grade. So I was like 12 years old that I was having these first really drawing the parallels to me. You know, I remember in seventh grade, my seventh grade science teacher asked us, is the earth alive? Why or why not? And for me, my answer was undoubtedly like, yes, you know, the earth is alive. You know, even like aside from all the life that we see just on the little crust, you know, with the plants and the 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 animals and just this very very thin layer that we have over the whole planet of actually biologically living material the the process of magic and the the magma and the movement and the death and the rebirth and of course i was using different words for it at the time but for me at 12 years old science was a means of getting closer to that aliveness and 
then it was a couple of years later that I was exposed to really, you know, actually having an opportunity to study and practice shamanism, which for me, it was just like, oh, thank goodness. You know, here's another, like these two parts of the same picture right here. It makes total sense to me. And then, you know, now as I'm looking at people who are so spiritually hungry, who have been exposed to modern medicine and exposed to, you know, the scientific world that we are brought up in about like, oh, here's how the the body works. And this is the definitive understanding of if you don't want to get sick, go get a vaccination or, you know, just all these these ideas that we are indoctrinated with and there's so much hunger and that when we finally learn that there is also this other path there, it doesn't mean that the science is any less valid in, in some cases. Um, it just means that there's this other picture there and it's this deep soul yearning just as I am. And I know I don't actually know anyone who's only experienced the other side. I'm sure they're out there, you know, looking at things solely through the spiritual filter. Like I am, I am totally sure that there's also this thirst of investigation of like, okay, well tell me about, you know, the, the chemistry to explain that. And for me, the magic isn't lost in the numbers. The magic isn't lost in knowing about the names of different chemicals and elements. It's enhanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, as we're especially seeing um, such developments in, in like quantum physics, right, that we're, we're starting to see the expression of consciousness on matter. And we're starting to see lots of experiments on consciousness and uh, the, the way that we're able to communicate with each other, uh, you know, and through our minds and we're able to pick up information from things and from people. And so there's a lot of corroborated uh, spiritual, um, you know, things that people have been talking about for a long time, but that we can actually say, Oh yes, that's, that's a real thing. And, you know, people have been in this investigation for a long time, and I just am thinking about like Alan Kardec and the Spirits book, and um, you know where that was a very scientifically led uh, push for years and years and years to document uh, mediumistic activities and to receive information from spirits about the spiritual realms, and to do it over and over and over again from, with different mediums, bringing through different information from the spiritual realms and documenting it for so long to come up with, yeah, they're all, they're all saying the same things about the spiritual realms. So in a very scientific, like he was, he came from a scientist's background. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think we can look at is how can we be utilizing the scientific methods and uh, the concepts of the way that we come up with our scientific information and principles in relationship with spirituality. So whether it's by uh, documenting and working with groups of people so that we're, we're able to see effects over time and over uh, groups of people so that we're able to prove some of this stuff that we're saying this is true. But hey, let's get involved with actually proving the fact that meditation really does work. Like if you're, if you have an amazing meditation practice or uh, an incredible uh, practice of some kind, I have a, a, a friend that I know who is a, a medicine carrier uh, and he's been going in and, and, and taking medicine um, and, you know, and having brain scans so that they can study person's brain as they are on these entheogenic uh, plant medicines. And, you know, it, there are ways that, that, that those of us who are involved in spirituality can start to explore what does it mean to be a scientist within my spiritual practice and to bring like, okay, solid facts to the world as to what's going on with me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. I love this, you know, the, the works that have been published, you know, you mentioned the, the spirits book, the work of Alan Kardec. Um, I would also throw out if we're looking at a couple more recommend book recommendations, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton's book, the biology of belief is a really good one. 
and uh, by Candace Pert, Molecules of Emotion. So looking at uh, you know, some of these different physiological, and the, both of those are particularly concerned uh, primarily with health, with, mm -hmm. you know, let's look at the body, let's look at the relationship to spiritual practice on, on the physical form. You know, you're mentioning the, the brain scans on medicine, uh, you know, I know they've done a lot of MRIs on like meditating monks and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's really quite amazing. Yeah, and I would also throw in there uh, another one that's a little kind of off the 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 pace, but uh, Mark Wolin's book, It Didn't Start With You, which has to do with epigenetics and the amazing research that's coming out now on epigenetics, on lineage work, on the things that we're holding in our DNA, in our cells, in our cellular systems, in our in our physical body that have to do with things that happened in our in our family in the past and, and ways that that's affecting our health and well-being now. So it's also a really fascinating merge of spirituality and science that we're seeing this, this awareness of epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And Kat, I really love, and I wanted to expound a little bit on what you were suggesting to people about using your personal practice to prove, even if it's only to yourself, but mm -hmm. prove that there is actual measurable validity in what you're doing. So, you know, whether it's only for yourself or whether it's, you know, for a group of people or whether you end up writing or publishing papers on it, you know, I mean, this is something that, that anyone can do. Anyone can run a scientific study or take data and, uh, you know, if depending on where you want to get your paper published, I mean, if you're submitting it to big journals, there are certain things that you need to do to make sure that they're, you know, that they're even looking at it. But even it's as, if it is quite as simple as taking notes in your journal of like on days when I do my practice, I feel and experience these things on days when I don't, I feel and experience these things. Or if it's, you know, taking your heart rate throughout the day or, uh, you know, making notes about, um, about different qualities in your energy or whatever you want to do. I'm a huge fan of data and spreadsheets. Like I, I love this. I can talk this language all day long and let's combine this. Let's use science as our ally, as our friend to support the development and growth of spiritual practice and vice versa. Let's use spirituality for continued inspiration of what can we look at next from a scientific perspective. How can we use the ethics and the, the energy behind what we're doing to support clean technology, you know, green technology, um, responsible, sustainable development of innovation, actual healthcare practices that, and healthcare systems that support wellness and prevention. You know, these, these things can only support each other from a, a humanitarian perspective, I mean, the highest goal of both is to improve, understand life. Let's start there. Understand life and improve upon it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this. Um, you know, there's a couple of other pieces to, you know, if, if you're spiritual, you, you know, you may be like, well, I don't really have, like, I'm super not scientific. I'm very woo-woo. I'm very spiritual over here. Um, you know, utilize that spiritual practice. <clears throat> Maybe you have a practice of prayer and you pray every day. And so add into your prayer prayers for uh, scientists to be guided toward these things that we're talking about, right? The, the um, green tech and, and ethical practices and, and really serving humanity. Utilize your prayer practice to call on that for humanity. Um, it is, is something really powerful that you can do as a spiritual practitioner. Um, and also, I, I think we talked about this in, in channeling work. Um, you know, if you have a scientific uh, awareness or, or background, a history, um, and you, you start channeling and you start asking for information uh, that that has to do with you know green tech and and uh, things that are going to serve humanity. Uh, this is a way that we can utilize spirituality channeling to receive information for the betterment of humanity. So these pieces can come together and can create a beautiful marriage where we we get to see positive in influence from both directions.
And I think the internet's a little funky. At the uh, I want to add in. There you are. <laughs> Go ahead, I, I want to add in with this that science is not the enemy. No. You know, and I know the the type of person who is more likely to be watching this episode or listening into this episode later is probably the type of person who's either an established or aspiring spiritual practitioner or someone who is already immersed in the spirit side. And I've come across every now and then I've come across a handful of people, practitioners, etc., who almost have, you know, that chip on the shoulder I was describing about the scientific community against spiritual practitioners. It goes the other way too. I've seen plenty of spiritual practitioners who have a chip on the shoulder about like, well, I shouldn't have to justify what I'm doing to science. Like I shouldn't have to prove what I'm doing or why should I place more importance upon a practice that is quote unquote scientifically proven when like I know what it does for me. And I will say that that attitude is just as damaging as the other way around. So let's, uh, you know, hold that intention, Kat, like you were saying, like, let's hold that intention and that prayer for science to, um, um, you know, to be adopting some of these innovations, calling in this green technology, etc. Let's welcome in the amazing allyship that's and potential that science has to play in coming into expanding spiritual consciousness and yes we don't need science to prove what we're already doing you know like there's there's a lot of even quantum physics like finally people will understand i'm not bananas and and yet we can be understanding in like science is is incredibly valuable it has so much to offer not in terms of like okay it's okay because science says it's so or because science proves it no in terms of like it's another means of understanding the same information and it's more information and it's accessible to more people and some people understand and respond to that language more easily it's a tool it's a very powerful tool so welcoming in the conversation i know all of us out there have had conversations anyone who's doing this work in the world has had conversations from people who think it's bullshit and i can tell you i, I can pretty much guarantee i've had all those conversations before you know from all sorts of haters and we can either hate them back and say like, well, fuck you. I know what I'm doing and it works for me. Or we can say, huh, that's interesting. You know, like, let's actually talk about that. Like, let's, where's this belief coming from that you have that spiritual practice isn't real because science says blah, blah. And usually it's coming from a very wounded and uninformed point of view. So, you know, like I think, I don't remember, did I mention this on last week or a couple of weeks ago, that person who was writing on my Facebook post about alchemy? Mm -hmm. did, yeah. 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 Okay. Right. And so this person who was saying that I was insulting Einstein by saying that he was an alchemist. Well, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's, this person has no idea. Yeah. And I can yeah, well, I mean, love on that yeah. and understand. Yeah, he was an alchemist. And, and, and so like these people, People who have these really emotional reactions to like, you know, to say like, no, we can't entertain these, these spheres together. Let's just, you know, understand many paths to the top of the mountain. How can we hold in our intentions for the graceful integration of these bodies of knowledge that are ultimately serving the same purpose? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the piece is the grace is how do we have grace? How do we have grace in the face, <laughs> grace in the face of someone who cannot, will not, uh, you know, entertain our possibility that we have, that we have a possibility that there are angels, we have a possibility that there are beings, we have a possibility that energy is a thing, we have a possibility that we have a soul maybe, and someone else is like, no, that's just not a thing, sorry. Um, you know, how do we have grace within that, that it's less about being right than it is uh, sometimes about allowing someone to have their experience and to not put them off so much that they never put their toe in the water again, um, which I think sometimes we do. We're just like, ah, here's all the things I know, and um, you're wrong, and instead of you know really meeting people where they're at, which takes something and being kind and compassionate with where someone is on their like, we're all in a spiritual journey one way of looking at it or another 
and where they're at and how we can gently hold the door open for someone um, instead of just like, you know, bashing them with the door in the face when they're, they're like starting to peek in. Um, so I think that that's our, all, all of our individual responsibilities for doing that. It's not always easy uh, because some people engage in such a hostile manner, uh, especially on the internet, but, <laughs> you know, choose your battles wisely and, um, you know, be that beacon, right? That beacon of light that's like, I'm here. If you want to have a conversation around, you know, what's coming up for you, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think today was a little bit less around like actionable tools and more about, you know, like, hey, what's the philosophy and the purpose behind what we're doing? And, and if nothing else, I think I would love to leave you with that of like, how can we show up in the way that we want to be of service? in continuing the conversation in understanding that that science and spirituality really are quite frankly two sides of looking at the same thing and how can we uh you know create that space for conversation for investigation and and also i i challenge everybody to look at what are your blind spots too you know do do you have blind spots around the the significance of science or is there any wounding there and looking at okay what are my beliefs around science what are my beliefs around spirituality like what what role do they both play in my life are they united are they separate what does that mean to me you know this this will set us up for that much more success when we're having these conversations like Kat was saying whenever we're engaging with somebody who's in this period of inquiry or, you know, maybe for them, the door is open this much and they're kind of like holding their eye up to the crack. Like we've been there in some form, in some degree, we've been there. So if we can have that conversation with ourselves, then it'll be easier for us to have that conversation with other people and not take it so personally. You yeah, know? So that's the thing, not to take it personally. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Not to feel attacked because someone's saying like, oh, well, you're full of shit because you believe that animals go to heaven or whatever the deal is. You know, it's like <laughs> that. Right. And, uh, you know, so then really understanding instead of like, oh, my gosh, they think I'm full of shit. Like, fuck that. You know, actually looking at, OK, well, why do I think that? Why do I believe that? And how does that improve my at the very least how does that improve my life make my life better to believe that animals go to heaven or to believe that rocks have souls or whatever the thing is and uh you know and be able to instead of just holding it because like blind faith i think is is just as useless as blind data you know <laughs> and in my mind like, sorry, that sounded a little bit harsh, but like to me, faith and data are really more, more helpful and more beneficial when they support each other. Mm -hmm. So if I have a belief and here's why, ultimately that is way more powerful than, well, I just believe this or like, oh, well, I just have all the reasons, but like no context for it. So ultimately that's how that relationship, I, I experience it fitting together. It's like, well, here's the belief and here's why. And ultimately they support each other really nicely as opposed to one or the other. Right. And, um, and sometimes to explore the belief, the beliefs a little bit uh, more deeply in context of, of, uh, of science. Um, you know, I'll just say something I know where we need to wrap up, but, um, you know, I have, I, I have an amazing partner and he does not really believe in angels and such. And that has been a huge, 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 huge struggle for me. And um, I, have had to look at it for myself in in some regards and then start to look at okay well um how in in science are these are these compatible right that we're looking at you know we're looking at rays of light we're looking at rays of frequency and it's proven that certain rays of color frequency certain tones of you know tonalities create certain changes they 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 tune into certain areas of our body. They, uh, they create a certain uh, feeling inside of us. And with a uh, collective consciousness believing certain things, it gains more power. It gains more influence. It gains more validity just through the collective belief systems of people. So, um, you know, with that, I can say, well, 
you know, whatever you want to believe about angels, but it also like by, by invoking these certain frequencies, which have names because it's good to, it's nice and easy to name things. Then we, I can create a certain effect and uh, a consciousness and awareness, a point of focus that can create change from a point of focus. It's really hard to create change without a point of focus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can, we can start to alter our own, like, okay, how does this fit? How does this fit into context of other people's possible belief systems and what we do know about uh, how things work on the physical plane? So. Um, anything else, Michelle, before we sign off? Oh, it's so good. I love I think I want to leave people with that, just that kind of invitation to look at things from both sides. Don't take for granted that any anything has an only one face of truth. You know, there are always many faces of truth. And and really see the allyship between them. That's, I think, what I would like to leave people with is like, you know, be open to the many paths to the top of the mountain and then understand that these these beliefs and understandings don't detract from each other, they, they support each other and they can inform each other. And ultimately, more knowledge, you know, that phrase knowledge is power, I mean, is, is really, I prefer to think of it as like more understanding is empowering. So think about how can I bring different faces of understanding or different knowledge about the different faces of truth to empower myself with more knowledge and more, more scope of awareness. Beautiful. Thank you, Michelle. So, uh, so uh, happy that you joined us for today's topic. You can see we were super excited about it. And if you have any questions or if you would like to uh, suggest a topic for a person that we can have on our uh, podcast, you can reach out to us at shaman sister sessions at gmail.com at our Facebook page, shaman sister sessions, or via our amazing new website, shamansistersessions.com. And feel free to drop us a line. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you're experiencing in your uh, practice, in your life, and how maybe this is, uh, you know, if you gathered a new awareness or a new tool, we would love to, to hear about it. And next week, Michelle, what's our topic? I don't remember what's going on. <laughs> um, I have, uh, I'm sub or accepting, there we go, the word. I'm accepting applications for the I Am Alchemy program through about next week. So March 13th is my deadline for you're interested uh, in the I am alchemy program I've do in submitting an application for this year long intensive certification is what you got going on um, the next thing is light warrior retreat which is uh, the weekend of March 17th in Orange California and this is a stay at retreat for healers, shamans, coaches any of those involved in a, a spiritual uh, offering to the world. We're going to be working on masterminding business development and also uh, doing uh, some amazing energetic and spiritual practices, receiving healing work, and uh, developing our, our tool set. So that's the next thing I have going on. And um, if you're interested in that, reach out right away because it's very soon. And yeah, other than that, uh, we will see you next week, uh, Tuesday at 1 p.m. For so Earth Rhythms and the Equinox. Okay, great. Is Earth Rhythms and Equinox, because we are hitting the, oh my gosh, the Equinox already. Um, right. <laughs> amazing how fast time flies. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you again next week. Thank you.